The following is a conversation with Dr. Lydia Mapstone, a microbiologist by training, currently working as co-founder and CEO of Booby Biome. Booby Biome is a startup biotechnology company that's working in the field of the microbiome. It aims to produce new live biotherapeutic products for preterm infants. This is Inside Matters. My name is Dr. James McElroy. I hope you enjoy it. Dr. <laughs> Lydia. You are a doctor now, right? I am a doctor, yeah. 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 When did you get the PhD? Uh when did I get it? Well, I did my viva in April last Have year. You just like erased it from your brain. Oh honestly. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> no, trauma. no, I loved my PhD. I loved it. It was just really stressful having a company at the same time. <laughs> As I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> just trying to balance them both. I, I understand. And there's so much failure in both companies and PhDs. Right. So when you combine them together, it's even more but interesting. I, so I and you're going to tell me the story now. I, <laughs> I thought you'd pressed pause on the company for a while. No. No, it was Oh, it's even more impressive. It's even more it's impressive. It's ticking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, before we get onto that great story, mm. I'll take you back a step. Okay. How did you get interested in what you did your PhD in? Oh, my PhD. Oh, um, well, I did, well, I'm a biologist. So I did my undergrad degree in biological sciences, which is really general. Um, so it covers... I think I studied mangroves, bats, ants, a bit of human, not much though, um, plants, just very, very broad. Um, and then I found microbes the most interesting mm. in my in my undergrad degree. Mm. Um, I think actually when I, first, <laughs> when I first really learned about how important microbes are in those communities was when I had a tutor when I was a little first year student. I had a tutor and she's really interested in bats and she, she got us to write essays on bats. And then one day she's like, do you know what, guys, instead of having to write an essay on a bat this week, um, I've, I've decided to open it up and we can talk, you can do an essay on caves, anything you want about caves. And I think she was hoping we were all going to, you know, talk about bats because what they're the most interesting thing in caves. Right. So she thought, and then I went but and did But it's the bugs in the caves. It's the bugs in the yes, caves. Yes, of course exactly. it is. <laughs> microbes, what the hell are they doing there? How do they survive? <laughs> um, so I did a whole essay on um, all the different microbes that live in caves. And do you know what? I don't think she even read it. All right. <laughs> I didn't get but the marks back. That but stimulated. That stimulated me. It made me very, be very, I just found it really interesting. Um, and they went and did a master's in synthetic biology, biotechnology. Um, and I just, I just think synthetic biology and microbes are so cool. We're not really, we're not a synthetic biology company at Booby Biome, but we're very interested in that. As that's really my background, um, Symbio. And uh, yeah, just microbes, how, what we can do to microbes to get them to combat the different challenges we've got. Uh, so it, I, Master's project, I got involved in something called iGEM, which is the world's largest synthetic biology competition. Oh. And uh, we sort of made a team, and it's a bit like having a little company. So you have a team, you've got three months right. to build something in the lab, and okay. then you go on and you pitch it at the competition, and then you go win prizes, and there's lots of different people get involved. And we, my team got, got really excited with bacteriophages. So not not quite microbes, but bacteriophages, and we come up with this. So for the listener, these are tiny viruses that... Yes infect bacteria essentially yeah yeah and they're inside of us yeah there's loads of them in a way big, more of them than bacteria way, right? yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 so what did you do with phage then at uh, the iGEM we well we thought it'd be really cool because bacteriophages are very specific to the bacterium so a bit like how you know cold viruses only really infect us it's the same with bacteria each bacteria's strains even um can have a particular phage for them and so we thought it'd be really neat if we could engineer bacteriophages to deliver um, a CRISPR package, which is a sort of a sort of like molecular scissors, which can snip up bits of DNA. So we, we engineer the phages to deliver, they infect the bacteria, and then the bacteria then have this sort of delivery, the sort of enzymes inside them now, yes. which will then cut up antibiotic resistant <clears throat> genes on their plasmids. Oh, nice. So trying to stop. So you weren't trying to use phage to kill? No drugs which were resistant to antimicrobials what you were trying to do was remove the, the antimicrobial gene cassettes yes. from existence yes so just remove all it yes the, because it's and well, that protects the microbiome a lot more as well in that yes. in that respect interesting so, so yeah. for the, the listener then bugs become antibiotic or resistant antibiotics because they somehow acquire or develop um a toolkit which allows them to produce substances yeah. which block the antibiotics from having their action on the bugs, right? Yeah, so so a lot of bacteria, not all of them, but a lot of bacteria have their genomes where, you know, they 
that's where they make all their proteins from and how they live and survive and yeah and that then they also can have circular pieces of dna called plasmids which can be quite short they're sort of they just small circles and they will contain um often huge different number of genes for breaking down different antibiotics if they're exposed to them so most of their, their genes for antibiotic resistance aren't on their genomes. They're on these little bits of circular DNA, which they like to swap and shoot out at each other and swap, right. um, <laughs> and swap with each other. And that's how you get, you know, huge amounts of antibiotic resistance because you get, um, you know, different bacteria swapping all their favorite genes. And then yep. they end up having a whole cassette of these plasmids, these, these circular bits of DNA of all of the different genes for every single antibiotic yeah. <laughs> in them. One of the challenges with antibiotics as well is that because the body is such a reservoir of diversity, if you like, mm -hmm you might destroy lots of bugs that you want to destroy. Yeah. But there might be a tiny number who have those cassettes, those circular pieces of uh, code, and they survive. Yeah. But because they survive, they replicate, and then suddenly you've got a larger critical mass, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. Yeah. But the phages would resolve the issue of AMR potentially. Yeah. Potentially. Potentially. That's what we were trying. Well, that's what we, we sort of showed. You know, we only need three months to do it. But it was really fun. We won the best therapeutic prize as well, which was great. Boom. That really was, that was, yeah, it was just my first sort of hint of how you could yep. use biotech to try and, you know, do something good. Um, so actually, as well as that first phage that came in that cut up the antibiotic resistant genes, we then also had a second bacteriophage to mop up the ones which didn't oh, nice. get targeted by the first one. Nice. Trying to beat evolution that way. So yeah, that was quite a complicated project. I don't really know. For three months. Yeah, yeah. But did you do any team. scientific there was work? There's a big team. There were, yeah, 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 yeah. You did some scientific there work? There were nine of us. It wasn't just a concept, actually. No, no, we did it in the lab. We built these. We built, so we engineered oh, these phages. Goodness, it's amazing cool. how much you can achieve in three months. But we were a team of, there were nine of us all working full time. Uh, and we were lucky enough because we were at the University of Edinburgh at the time. And that's got lots of really yeah. great PIs and academics sure. that could you know, come in, chip in, give us a piece of advice. You know, give us a phage. <laughs> yeah, amazing. <laughs> Let's work on it. Why has no one? Maybe they have. They are. They are. Illigo, illigo bias. Oh, Xavier. Yes. 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 So I, I recently went to a webinar with him, and he was describing, and I was like, he was describing what his main, you know, innovation of his company is, and I, yeah. so I did that. <laughs> I did that as an iGen student in you know, yeah. ages ago. Yeah. I mean, obviously, he's taking it. He's he, actually, he's actually he, making it work. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, for us it's for weird. Time. I messaged him this morning. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that just, is weird. Yeah, just to say how you're getting on, because I I met with him in San Francisco in, in January. When you were saying that, I was thinking that sounds an awful yeah. lot like illegal. Yeah. But maybe it was different, because yeah. I'm, not, I'm not an expert at all in the, the gene editing yeah. or phage. I just know that phage are really important. They're very cool, yeah. And could be the future. They, yeah. They, but the phage companies, like, and um, Xavier won't mind me saying this, because he positions himself as a sort of synthetic mm. biology company, mm. rather than the microbiome company, yeah. per se. They've not really done it. The phage companies. There there isn't a standout, as far as I'm aware, mm. knock it out the park phage company anywhere. I think there's really big manufacturing challenges with phages. I mean, how do you how do you grow the phages? Ah, uh, so what you do is you'd get your bacteria um that the phage like to infect. Yep. Like in fact, you grow it up and when it's sort of really happily doubling really frequently, you add your phage to it. And then what happens is They chew um, them all up and yeah, then you just extract yeah. your phage. Yeah, yeah. So they just go, ooh. But what happens to the bacteria that they sort of shoot themselves into that's like clunk and debris that you need to move away isn't that's it? true that's true yeah so they lies the yeah they, they... Well, there's two types of phage so the one that we were having that was engineering the the first bacteria this was a, called a lysogenic phage so that actually wouldn't um cause the cells to burst that just sort of sits there oh. a bit like those little bits of dna those plasmids it makes like... so it sits there and they just sort of like shrivel yeah. up and die or what happens well, the, the dna gets passed on to the daughters it's a bit like a power plasmid was made probably it probably came from a phage um and yeah oh, interesting they just pass it on and they stay static then so you c they're like bacteriostatic phages yeah they just stay inside the bacteria and now and again they might mutate and become a, l a, l a lytic phage so they're just there for the ride yeah they're just there for the ride yeah oh, yeah that's very crazy cool. so that's, that's how it works so the first one with that's phage. crazy so there's a microbiome in the bug can i that's not an unreasonable analogy i've talked about this before there's a picobiome Yes. Or is it a nanobiome? Ooh. What's smaller, nano or pico? Pico. Pico. Pico's the smallest, so it's a nanobiome then. Yeah. So the nanobiome are all the phages that are kicking around, just chilling in the yeah. cell yeah. cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm of the bacteria. Yeah. Okay, you heard it here first. But I mean, we can't get too many of them because they'll start, if you get a bacteria with too many of them, they're using all their resources, aren't they? They're using all the cellular machinery to replicate and 
But surely they just replicate to the point where they burst the cell, or uh, yeah. is there some sort of control within? Yeah. Okay, we're getting really technical and phase just now, which is great. Because I'm not. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert either. <laughs> You just go now. So you are an expert. Blind leading the blind. Um, but yeah, no, it was an exciting project. Um, <laughs> and I really, yeah, really enjoyed it. And it was a really good way for us to figure, for yeah. me, experience for me to realize you could make something and it yeah. potentially have a massive impact. And then. And it, did it trigger some um, entrepreneurial flair yeah. inside of you? I would say yeah. so. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. Particularly because you won, right? You were like, yeah. wow. I well, can... we, we went the overall winners. That's a very prestigious prize. But we did win the Best Therapeutic Prize, which was important. That's a great, a great, for us. Uh, a um, great accolade. Yes. And then why I picked my PhD was because I then did a PhD. I wanted to, I just wanted to live in London. That was purely, not particularly because I'm clever reasons, but I was just like, you know what? I really want to live in London. So PhD look good. And, and yeah, I just bought the project. Well, I, I got into a really great program called Lido, which is the worst acronym ever, but it's, it's a program, a PhD program that is run and it's all across London. There are different universities which okay. offer projects and then you pick from a portfolio of about, I don't know, 200 different projects, which one you want to do. And so that's why I, I just read 200 different projects and I just thought I want to do something in synthetic biology and microbiology still. Yep. And that's why I picked my PhD topic, uh, which, which was, was nothing to do with the microbiome. Well, sort of, same techniques, but not really microbiome. Um, it was to uh, work out for us, to come up with a system for genetically modifying and also seeing if we can cultivate a species of algae. Mm -hmm. Well, technically it's called a cyanobacterium. It's a blue-green algae um, called spirulina so that we can make a space crop for astronauts when we go to Mars. <laughs> this is so, so the thing. In a nutshell. <laughs> that, <laughs> I hope we do get to Mars. But yeah. so when people get to Mars, they're going to need to eat. Yes. And exactly. they're limited by basically what they carry over. And one day there might be shuttles just going back and forth all yeah. the time. But this would be some sort of fresh food. Yes. Well, I mean. Is that as good as it's going to get on Mars? What? Spirulina. Spirulina. <laughs> <laughs> Genetically engineered spirulina. So those that don't have an Earth suddenly sounded really before, good. <laughs> it can be best described as swampy. So yeah, this and sulfurous. I won't but, tell you what we what you said about the juice. No. I'm hoping we'll sponsor this podcast. I won't yeah. say no more because yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Swampy is good, by the way. Swampy is, an, uh, is a compliment. Yeah. For a, for a, I, in my opinion, for someone that's wanting yeah. to. For a good gut. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I completely agree. I completely agree with that. And the spirulina is amazing. And I'm quite sad that spirulina isn't one of the ingredients, actually. Also, swampy. You've not actually drank from a swamp. No. Well, maybe you have. Okay. Right. <laughs> Fine. So, spirulina is swampy and you have to take it in a capsule. But it's or... really, really good for you. It's got all of your essential amino acids in it, for example. So, you, can, you don't have to eat different proteins. You can just eat spirulina and it's got balance of all the essential amino acids it's also got the same amount of right. protein hold on a second because i had I, I know i think you've listened to andy scott on the podcast the bodybuilder that was so big you couldn't fit through the door <laughs> also my personal trainer um when i'm in glasgow uh, yeah and uh, you can imagine how fun that is um he's of the view that you just can't get big like him if you don't eat meat all the time mm. and there's no veggie vegan bodybuilders who are as big as the ones who have animal-based protein because it's more complete but it sounds like it's not more complete it sounds like spirulina yeah 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 has everything you need yeah although to get the quantity that you need protein i mean it is really high protein content spirulina so if you look at for example insects if you eat insects because that's another big yep. thing for mars as a yep. potential food source insects and spirulina they're, they're, wow <laughs> i know they're really, they've got a lot to look forward to with that is, they um yeah spirulina spirulina has the same amount of protein as insects if you on a on a gram for gram basis wow but that's but why that's incredible is because insects are a higher trophic level so in, insects have to eat something like spirulina or grass and then gather up their protein but spirulina is cutting that yeah cutting that and it's way more energy efficient because you get the same amount of protein yeah but with and you don't have to digest all the yeah yeah, fast yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, it, and it's got all the essential so superfood yeah it is a superfood and it does deserve that name but there are some massive limitations to spirulina. It's still quite hard to grow. It's hard to grow it in a dense enough culture. So when you have spirulina powder, mm. that must be derived from a culture. It's an algae. So yes. somebody needs to create like a big vat yes. or like a big system. Pipes are quite good because you need a big surface area so light can penetrate. And they just scrape off the spirulina. Oh, you probably pipe. filter it. It's quite long. It's quite a sort of, oh, is it? sort of mat. It sort of floats. Yeah, it actually, it, it actually occurs in alkaline lakes. So it's sort of, 
Um, and Chad, for example, is an example when it sort of floats to the top and forms these big slimy mats, and then people oh. just gather it in and then eat it. And, oh. yeah. and it's, it's really good for you. They, they found that people, the, the locals there that eat spirulina, they're, I think they're very like healthy. 30, yeah, 30% less likely to get vitamin A deficiency than if, they don't, if they're locals and they don't eat it. Really? So, yeah, and it can make up a huge amount of their diet as well. Wow. But, so what did, did you manage to develop a method to grow it efficiently over your PhD? So, well, I was trying to see if we could grow it with the resources locally available on Mars for astronauts. That was one part of my project. Did Elon Musk call you and say... Do you know what? No, I should have really reached out to him in hindsight. That was a yeah. mistake. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe... That's his vision. Yeah. Maybe he needs some spirulina in his life. Yeah. It was that, that's probably one of my biggest regrets, not sending him an email. <laughs> it would have taken five minutes. Hey, Elon. Why didn't I we do? got something for you. <laughs> but surely the outputs are still there. You could yeah. go back to it if you want. Yeah. You're yeah. busy now with your venture, which we're going to get on to. Mm. So. Mm. so what was the output then of all of that? And how did, how did you decide that? Because not many people have done what you've done and what you're doing, which is decide to start a company during your PhD in a subject that doesn't actually link to your primary topic of research, right? Mm, that's, yes. that's the case. It's, yes. it's different. So yes. how did yeah. that happen? Uh, well, I think I realized from iGen, but I really wanted to get involved with uh, a startup or, you know. Why was it? The buzz? Yeah, it was yeah. so fun. And buzz. I thought we, we could move really quickly, actually, even though we were a small team. Yep. And it just seems like we can make a big impact. And I think... Uh, from that, I was like, well, do you know what? I need to learn what it might be like to be in a startup. And you like the feeling of winning as well, presumably. Right? Yeah, that, yeah that, that's fun. Although, to be honest, I've learned how to fail a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, stopped, we don't win a lot. We mostly don't win. I mean, my, my <laughs> we top, mostly lose. <laughs> I think my first prize was £500 at the University of Edinburgh pitching competition. Oh, yeah. And uh, I sort of ran back. <laughs> just like, yes, get it. I was like, it's so good. It's, I'm going to be able to do so much with that. Was that with your company or was that with a different... The, what was this was, yeah, like? this was the very, very early days of enterobiotics, like the earliest of earliest days. Like yeah. it started in a 24-hour computer laboratory in the University of Edinburgh. I was trying to find a topic to write my dissertation on. Yeah. I was not having much joy I was doing a very nerdy form of procrastination, which I was going from medical journal to medical journal, landed on a nature paper that showed that if you move bacteria from a thin mouse mm. into an overweight mouse, mm. the overweight mouse loses weight. Yeah. I was like, whoa. Yeah. yeah. That's honestly what happened. You just made the noise and that, that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's not much going on in my brain anyways, but <laughs> it just sort of, Fried something it. happened. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, that is unbelievable. Because I tried to start a personal training business beforehand, which failed miserably. One client, and that was my mum. <laughs> um, and so, so I, I stood up and and I just, yeah, I won, and yeah. I, I just had this idea. I was like, I wanted to do this fecal transplantation thing, and I won the prize, and I was just so excited. I was like, I've got to do this now. So it's amazing what something like that can do to your yeah. confidence. No, completely. Yeah. So actually, really similar to how Booby Biome started. Really similar. So. I, I sort of was like, well, do you know, it'd be cool to try and see what, if we could get a startup or get involved. And so I just uh, came across a competition that we could do as PhD students called Biotech Yes, which is just a, I, have you heard of Biotech Yes? Oh, okay. Maybe. Well, it's, it's mostly for PhD. Where is it? Not really, Where is it based? France? Uh, it's not, no, in Nottingham. No, it's just a UK wide competition. Um, where they try and encourage PhD students, postdocs to come up with a mock company. And then it's a three day you know, workshop where you Great. meet experts and then you do a pitch competition at the end and then if you go through that, you go to the finals um, and then... Sounds yeah. fun. Yeah, it was really fun. You meet lots of interesting people. Yeah, too, yeah. yeah. So, I mean... But how many people from Biotech Yes are still going with their company? Not that many. Probably very, very Not few. that many. Yeah. But the ones that are, they're doing well. They're doing well. That's good. Um, That's but good. yeah, they... Uh, I, so, but I was like, okay, well, let's do, I want to do this competition. Looked around me, let's, let's try and get a team together. So, we, you know, I, I got a team together and then we were going to the pub over that summer before the competition and we're like right what what area that was a testing ground yeah it was actually yeah it was a good testing ground. good we're, testing ground yeah we we're sort of like what area can we you know to, to, can we innovate someone in? said boobs actually no no well yes <laughs> 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 someone did say boobs but that was later that was me just sort of looking about the different areas and there's so many different things going on in modern life but as a microbiologist microbiome's always been yes. really interesting and i just i just came across a four page document called Post Notes, which the government releases every year. They're four-page documents hmm. um, on areas which the UK government thinks we should innovate in, in science and technology. And one of them in 2018 was on the microbiome. 
And there was just this one line. So I was reading about the microbiome and they were saying, we need to really innovate in the microbiome. <laughs> Here's the reasons why the microbiome is interesting. Oh. Um, and it's a really interesting document looking, looking back at it now. But there was just one line in that note where it just said, the breast milk, my breast milk has, seems to have microbes in it, which is interesting. And babies not breastfed are more likely to get, you know, autoimmune diseases. And I was just like, what? Yeah. That was a... Pfft. That was a brain explosion. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, I just assumed it was sterile. I, d- I didn't realize right. that, that there was a microbiome in a breast milk. Right. I mean, now it seems to be a microbiome Basically, nothing, nothing sterile. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's, oh, there's oh, a microbiome in everything, including blood. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which is another nice. mind-blowing thing. Yeah. But anyway, sorry, yes. Yeah, so read that. That and, blew your mind. That blew my mind. And then we like, well, what's, well, what is in this breast milk microbiome? And there were a fair, fair happy number of papers published but it wasn't included in the human microbiome project and right. the level of detail and for the listener that was a big deal wasn't it yes. that was funded by the national institute for health in the u.s focused on trying to map the microbiomes of the body essentially yeah. right yeah. yeah yeah and it didn't include the breast no no wow okay so the level of detail just wasn't that high of exactly what bacteria are living in this breast milk microbiome how do they get there um well how does it differ there just was, there wasn't yep. there wasn't a lot of detail at that point in 2018 and so we just thought well you know what this is classic women's health in particular being overlooked underfunded um let's yep. let's see if we can if, if we can innovate in this space and so we just came with that idea we weren't really planning on taking it forward but we just got such good feedback from that competition we just sort of looked around and actually we were a team of five and um we were all doing phd students i was all doing phds and uh me and my two co-founders that took it forward were the ones that sort of were like, yeah, you know, we stayed up really late the night before the pitch. We realized we worked really well together. Okay. And the other two amazing scientists now, yeah. both really good academics now, yeah. but they they decided, you know, for them it wasn't They wanted wasn't a different life. But that was fine. We're still really good friends with them. Um, and, you know, like I say, they're very successful academics in their own right. But yeah, we, we took it forward, the three of us, and we just started doing competitions. How was the pitching competition though, by the way? Oh, the first one? Yeah. Oh, awful. We lost. We didn't even get through to the next round. <laughs> Why? What happened? Through. I don't know. No, but it was just another company that was better than us. Well, also, interestingly, doing my, but they didn't go forward with it though. They didn't win either, which is sad. How sad. But yeah, they they also, the one we lost to were doing acne treatment using microbiome. Okay, disease, topical. Which is very relevant to be fair. Very, very relevant. Um, and I don't think they went forward with it. I mean, acne is driven by the microbiome. Yeah. It's just bugs that yeah, are yeah. getting caught in the, the glands. I can't remember what they're called. Sebaceous glands or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we didn't win, but that was our first taste of failure, but also first taste of actually excitement. And at that point, were you already in your head fine at the idea of or whatever um, actually doing this alongside your PhD? If something was to come of it, you were going to do it at the same time. Because that's a snowboard. huge, it's, it's a huge thing. It's yeah. one of those things you do a little bit. You yeah, can, you know, like oh, this is an idea. Let's just see how far we push it. Yeah, we'll just push it a little bit. Yeah, we'll go. We we'll do another competition. Why not? We yep. do. I mean, we, we didn't win that. What one. was the original pitch idea? Can you remember? Yeah, what, yeah, what yeah, did, yeah. The original idea, and maybe we will do this one day, was to sample women's breast milk, look at the exact microbial composition in her milk, and then if they're missing out on any key species, we'd supplement to give a very personalised, yep. a personalised product. So if you, now supplement the with the bacteria back from our culture collection, and it would find its way into their breast milk. Oh, sorry. Uh, then we'd, we'd no, we should mix it with her milk and then feed her infant. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Got it. That was our original. So I was like, how, how does it get there? But how does it get there originally? Oh, God. Everyone asks this question and no one's entirely sure. No one knows. There's two theories. There's two theories. Okay. Theory number one is that it just comes from the infant mouth. So when, when the baby's feeding, eh? it just sort of bacteria in baby's mouth goes back into the ducts and it crawls up and there's been a bit of evidence for this if you know sampled baby's mouths but i suppose just to push back a little bit could be could it not be that it's the other way yeah, yeah. yeah. okay yeah, right. yeah so that's theory number yeah. one yeah uh but theory number two interesting is i think called bacteria translocation and that's when yeah. bacteria hitch a ride on uh, an immune system cell and sort of go travel through the lymph symptom wow. to the ducts that's... And there's been some, you know, there's been evidence both for this. There's been evidence where they fed, they made these poor, sad, germ-free mice. These are mice which haven't been exposed to any microbes. And they fed, they fed them a probiotic and then they got them to have babies, baby mice. Um, and they found, you know, the, the bacterium that they fed to that mouse showed up in the mouse's milk. Um, mm. So, and so, you know, there's quite a lot of evidence for it's this. It's like a sci-fi thing. It is. It's they hitch not... a ride on yeah. an immune cell and then go, yep, this is where I need to be. Yeah. Yeah. And that might be some sort of 
incredibly conserved evolutionary thing that just happens with all humans, which yeah. again is another one of these my, my mind. There's just so much we don't know though. But, yeah, there's so much more research needs to be done on this. Mm. Um, and it's it's also it's it's one of those things where, you know, if it's really difficult to research it. And right. you know, our techniques for for culturing and assessing micro they're still pretty new. So sometimes people ask yeah. me, oh, do you think if the mother was a C-section baby herself, does that mean that she's passing on, she wasn't exposed to this first vaginal microbes of her mother, does that mean that her infant microbiome won't be as, as good or will be less diverse? And you've, you've just got to be like, we haven't been able to study it. Right. You know, so it's really exciting. You know, as we start to do these longitudinal studies, we'll get more answers on that. But okay. right now, these techniques weren't really around. So you're talking about the analytical toolkit that we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, and it has come on a long way though, hasn't oh, it? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. we're up until relatively recently trying to grow everything on plates. Mm -hmm. That's all we had. Yeah. And microscopes. And yeah. now we've got next generation sequencing yeah. technologies. Yeah, it's changed everything. PCR, you know. So, okay, cool. So it started to snowball. And I, I'm, it's funny, as you're telling the story, I'm thinking, God, it's the same as me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a super exciting thing. Yeah. And I think if you'd shown me a crystal ball and said, yep, in 2023, you'll be employing almost 70 people. You have an MHR license. You'll be just part of phase two study. I'd be like, what <laughs> surely not like that's yeah, yeah i'd be like that's mad yeah that's insane yeah. and it sounds like that's what's happened with you it's just like so it's like, treacled and then it's just yeah become this huge thing yeah yeah um you're gonna get to the point probably in the story where it became almost unmanageable to do the two yeah it yeah. was pretty unpleasant at times um <laughs> <laughs> well you know it was amazing so we managed to get we managed to get a very less amount of money so we managed to get 50k to work on our first sort of proof of concept. We start collecting milk. And what about PhDs? We're really lucky actually. So me and my two other co-founders. So I'm a- oh, Can I ask you, cool. sorry, just, just, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you were talking about the original idea. Yes. And then yeah. we were going to get onto what it became. And that's probably what you raised the 50K for, is that right? Yes. Okay, so what, what was then the idea that it became that you got some money? So, well, it was when we realized that the logistics of trying to do a personalized <laughs> medicine approach for microbiome was just, going to be an absolute nightmare one day that one day would be so cool right? very cool yeah. Yeah. yeah one day that would be the, the yeah. thing to do um, and we started looking more into the different babies which are do are most vulnerable to having dysbiosis so an, an, an imbalance in those beneficial bacteria in the gut and we realized there's three different there's there's three different sort of camps of babies there's obviously the babies that aren't given any breast milk so for actually 40 percent of um the first bacteria in, in an infant's gut come from breast milk so it's a huge input of these first wow. beneficial bacteria. So of course you'd think, okay, formula fed babies, obviously they, they're missing out on breast milk. So they're missing out on these first really important bacteria. Early colonizers. Early colonizers, yeah. It's been estimated it's about 30% from your birth delivery as well. So it's 30% from when you're wow. born, from if you're born naturally, you're born you know, from, your, from your mother's vagina and you're coated in all those wow. microbes. And then of course, um, if you're lucky, Maybe she'll, have, maybe, maybe she'll have a little poo while, yep. while she's in labor, if you're lucky. So you might get some of them as well. So yep. it's, one of, it's one of some of those back bacteria. And then the next seeding is from how you're fed. Wow. And then there's going to be about you know, 30%, which is just... But just think about that. Dog. You know, if you have skin, two people or two babies, one's born through C-section and uh, bottle fed, the other's born through normal vaginal delivery or just vaginal delivery, whether it's forceps or not. And... Um, is breastfed. Yeah. There's a 70%. Yeah. All else being yeah. equal. Yeah. 70%. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. And they are much more likely to have different diseases like asthma, um, obesity is one, uh, diabetes. But interestingly, they can also be absolutely fine. <laughs> and that's what blows. That's what's so As is always the way. Because you can't, their genetics or maybe their dog was really good in the house that they had. And it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really, it's something that we're spending a lot of time at. What, no, dogs doing Do no, no, dogs, no, no, is a, dogs. That, dogs is a thing though yeah i know it is yeah 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 well dogs influence your microbiome for sure right yeah i mean i quite i did a parasite course in my undergrad oh. about dogs and cats and i don't know it's really put me off but you're right you're right they found that babies exposed to dogs growing up have more diverse microbiomes yeah, yeah. in early childhood yeah. but, incredible right. uh but yeah sorry so um where was i going with that? really interesting so you were talking about how the original idea wasn't viable because it was too difficult to scale. Yeah. yeah. Because logistically, you'd have to get a sample from every single mother, figure out what it's missing using a variety of tools, and then also 
replace what's missing, which might be different from a mother to mother basis. Yeah. And that's a different product for every person. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's yeah, 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 not feasible yeah, at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so that's when we started looking at, okay, well, what, let's see if, if we want to refine this a bit more, what yeah. are the different babies that actually are at most risk? And it's, if you're not given any breast milk, cause you're missing out on that, those, those, those beneficial bacteria and formula fed. The next camp is if you're born C-section, which we've touched on now. So C-section babies, they're missing out on those first sort of vaginal and, you know, um, GI tract microbes. And then the other group baby, which is, which are the most vulnerable, I agree, are preterm babies. So if you're born too early, it's really difficult, firstly, for mothers to produce enough breast milk because the milk and milk's not, not ready to come in. Yeah. 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 Um, Physiology is not sort of developed enough yet because of where they're at in the, um, the whole process of yeah, exactly. having a baby. Yeah. 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 Um, also, um, these babies are often on very high levels of antibiotics, uh, as is the mum as well right and as a result of that they have very very poor microbes and to be honest their their, their stomachs also aren't and their guts aren't developed properly so often they've got very leaky a leaky barrier and you know their tight junctions in their guts aren't close together so things can sort of slip through to their bloodstream so they're very vulnerable very vulnerable group and how important do you think tight junctions are and leaky uh-huh. gut is well pretty well why, <laughs> why are you asking that it sounds such evil a, glints such in your <laughs> eye <Jane. laughs> no <laughs> I mean, I have my own view. I, 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 don't, I don't want to. Mm, mm. I don't want to influence your thinking. No, no. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer to this, by the way. But so, I mean, yeah, <laughs> an <okay>. evil glint. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not plotting or scheming anything. Uh, I promise. Yeah. So, <laughs> I think with these preterm infants, it's fairly important yeah. because they, they, it's, it's just undeveloped. So you know, the crypts. Yeah. I'm just smashing the mic. Then the crypts aren't anywhere near as developed as well. You got they're not they're sort of stub stubby. You're meant to have lots yeah. of nice long. God, you, you probably know what the term is. I always forget it. Abs- uh, they're called um, crypts of li- crypt abscess. No, um, in your gut, high yeah, yeah, surface yeah, yeah. area. Oh yeah, yeah. I know exactly anyway, what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're, they're just not developed very well, and you know, it means if you do get a nasty opportunistic bacteria pathogen coming in, it can just very easily just slip through those the, those gaps Absolutely. and go into the blood. So I think for preterm infants, it is pretty important. I think for it, yeah, I totally agree with you. And I, I don't know why I was making an evil but <laughs> I think they're important for everybody. Yeah. I mean, if, for adults, arguably just as important or more important. I mean, when that barrier starts to break down, then they do translocate and influence local and systemic inflammation. And that kind of leaky gut, quote unquote, has been linked to all manner of yeah. problems, mm. both in the gut and beyond the gut. So, um, Figuring out how we can sort of get them tighter again yeah. through microbiome modulation is a key area of yeah. interest for me, uh, for sure. Yeah. And I hadn't appreciated that it was a big thing in preterm uh, babies, but it makes total sense. And it's probably the fact that they're preterm, probably the fact that they're getting loads of antibiotics. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah. it's just creating an entirely yeah. not normal yeah. situation or environment for them. Yeah, absolutely. So, and there's a lot of C sections and a lot of preterm. Yes, Babies, right? yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it makes it even harder for them. So, I mean, we really, there's a few diseases because of this that preterm infants are particularly vulnerable to. Yeah. One of them being necrotizing enterocolitis or NEC, yes. which is a very unpleasant disease. So actually, uh, I should say as well, about 10% of births are preterm and then about 10%, roughly about 10% of preterm infants will develop NEC at some point. And okay. uh, this is a really nasty disease. So yeah, like I say, it's when an opportunistic pathogen comes in, enters the bowel, um, and the immune system, which hasn't really been trained how to respond appropriately, responds with really high inflammation. And then you get necrosis of the, of the lining so of the gut. death. So death. Yeah. It's That's a, a, a bad thing. Very bad thing. Because then you get leakage of the gut into the abdomen and it can have really high mortality rates. It's fatal. Yeah. yeah. And probiotics have been used. Yes. So ne- there's been loads of trials where they've shown that probiotics can reduce the incidence of this, of neck happening. And there's been no other treatment for it, really, to date. None of, it's not used in hospitals. And the best thing, if you've got a piece of infant to try and reduce this, is, is to give them breast milk. And in, in hospitals, if you're really lucky, uh, if you've got a piece of infant and you can't breastfeed, your, your baby will be given donated breast milk, which is, which is the next best thing. However, it's been shown that actually you're still, your baby's still not quite as well off as if it was to get your own milk. And I think a big part of that mm. reason is because it's been sterilized, the donated ah. breast milk. So you are right. not receiving. So it's, in a, it's a bank of yes, breast milk. Yes, exactly. So they're receiving donated breast milk that's been pasteurized, which makes sense because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to give any, there's no chance of the infants getting a, 
you know, undesirable microbe coming in. But so they get the nutrients, the calories, yeah, the the, mac, the micro and macronutrients. Yeah, some of the immune system elements survive, not all though. So there's some immunoglobulin yes. in there. Yeah, yeah, it's but, a bit varied, but none of the bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about being so important. Yes, exactly. So so does that mean that there are big programs, like volunteer programs where women donate their breast milk? Yes, there are. Yes, yeah. There's um, the one in London, it's a Hearts Milk Bank, which is a really good one. Uh, but yeah, it's really helpful if, if mothers can overexpress, if they do overexpress milk, then they should try and donate it if they can because it's the next best thing at the moment. It's really interesting. For preterm infants, yeah. And it's, I presume, yeah, it's, only for preterm infants. It's not something that people would buy commercially. Like a, no, what? no, 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 it's none too, of that. It's too scarce a resource. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't, there's some weird dodgy stuff on Facebook, I think, where you can buy breast milk and bodybuilders love that. Bodybuilders <laughs> apparently, love that. apparently some do in America. Oh yeah. my goodness, that's ridiculous. Mm, I know, and I think they can drink, yeah, that's, no, that's, that's not good. Right, well, next time we get a bodybuilder on here, ask, I will ask, yeah. they probably won't readily disclose that no, they've been looking at buying yeah. that to get games. there's been these weird netflix exposed documentaries on the breast milk the weird breast milk trade on sort of really yeah 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 so there's a whole underground black market for breast milk. yeah it was just yeah 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 it's not good we, wow yeah. okay. it's, it's been unfortunate for us because you know we, we we we're trying to sampling very widely but you know we can't we're not going to use that obviously we need to be there at the sample site and you know make sure it's done properly 100%. and have the consent forms and 100 you know, i mean particularly like that. if that's so you're going to get on now to what the what you're doing yep. at Booby Bio. Yeah. And at what point in the journey did the name kind of form? Oh. <laughs> right at the beginning. Booby Bio was sort of like a joke name, to be honest. But we love it. It's, it's, it describes what we do, yep. you know. And it's, you know, if if we want to keep parents on board and mothers, I mean, they all love it. If you do market research on people that probably are going to want to buy our product, our, our product yep. it's parents and Right. They think it's great. Right. Not everyone loves it. It's a bit of a marmite mean, so admittedly. <laughs> booby bio. It took my dad quite a long time to say. He kept on calling us baby bio. And I'm oh, like, really? No, dad, it's booby bio. <laughs> Boobies. Booby bio. Is he there now? Is he, is yeah. he kind of on board with it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says it now. That's yeah. good. <laughs> so booby bio is doing supplementation for preterm infants or is Yeah, it so we really, drop? right at the moment, we're gunning for trying to create a product from the breast milk microbiome that we can supplement to preterm infants in hospitals with the hope that we can then, you know, reduce the incidence of, of, of neck in, in particular, but just for health in general, you know, if they can put on weight faster um, and, you know, just avoid other diseases such as late onset sepsis is a big one as well for preterm infants. That's really what we're, we're trying to do. Make a life life. so scary for parents, late onset sepsis. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That must be yeah. frightening. Uh, but, you know, we are still researching and, you know, right now we're just widely, very wide. We're running around London collecting breast milk. It's, unfortunately, it's mostly had to be London just because we've our labs in London. And the, this milk needs to be really fresh because as soon as we get milk, we um, take it back to the lab. We try and culture directly from it. And then we also extract all the DNA and, and look at what community yeah. structures there. But we want to do that quickly. We don't we want to keep as many of these bacteria. And we've got a really big culture collection now for different, very interesting microbes that we've, we've isolated from breast milk. And from that, wow. sort of designing our synthetic community. Are they very... So So is the idea that you'll have a consortia? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that consortia will be sold as a product, a drug or a probiotic, depending yeah. on where you go with it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Are you on the fence about yeah. that still? Or you can... It's, yeah, it, it is a difficult one. I think it's a, it's a, it's a question that most microbial, <laughs> microbial companies have because it's such a new area of the microbiome, the regulation behind it is yeah. is difficult because historically these probiotic products, have, they're, they're, well, they're, they're seen as food supplements. They still are seen as food supplements. Having said that, in the EU, no one actually has been given the, the status of a probiotic. So you can't say you're a probiotic uh, in Europe if you're selling a live bacterial product. You just, it's not, it's not been regulated. In America, you can, but there, there's a definition of what a probiotic is, and it says that you may have to make a positive impact yeah. on health. And to date, even though I think there's been over 200 different claims to the um, the food safety authorities in Europe and the UK to try and get that yeah. that status, that claim, and no, no one, no one's managed it. Yet. No one's managed it. No, no, it has been granted for wow. anyone. So I think you're talking about the WHO definition. Yes, sorry, yes, like, yeah, I think yeah. the WHO one, which is like probiotic, is a bacterium that when administered in sufficient quantities confers a health benefit yes. to the recipient or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Broadly speaking. And 
I think what you're saying is <laughs> how many of the probiotics? Well, this is what's so frustrating because right. you know, there's these probiotics that have just been around for decades and they're really yeah. good at making cheese, for example. Yeah. And they're not really doing, you can take them, but they're not, they're not going to do a lot. But then there's some yeah. probiotics that have been really intelligently designed. Um, so I'm, I'm going to name drop. Simproof, for example, is an adult probiotic you can take, full strains. So, and it's in liquid formulations. So that's the best way to do it and keep them in liquid, keep them alive. And then and, and you drink it. And there's been loads of clinical trials with, with, with them, but they still haven't been able to get this probiotic health status and they, they do do a huge amount of research that they've done to show that it's having a really great effect on your health um so it's very frustrating and but, but you can see how tempting it is as well as a product you know as a company developing back to your product to go down this easier less stringently yes. regulated route of being a food supplement i was speaking to someone at the conference that we were at earlier this week um which is a microbiome conference for the listener and someone was saying that they they describe the difference between live biotherapeutic products and probiotics as basically probiotics is more about your marketing spend and how much you can market and sell and get influencers and so on. Whereas the LBPs is more about convincing regulators and ultimately payers, whether it's the NHS or some sort of insurer in the US, for example, rather than the patient themselves yeah. who would be buying a probiotic yeah. off the shelf. So that's what they were saying. But also, if you think about it, LBPs, are probiotics in by the definition essentially yes yeah. it's quite confusing yes it is very confusing so i mean in terms of the, of, the, of the preterm infants in hospitals i think you you've got to get this right you've got to do all the research you you, you should you have to do clinical trials have to. so really that's a route we that's what that's what we're aiming you're going to do a clinical trial in a preterm infant population because that's going to be difficult right? oh yes it is going to be difficult but it's not there is a precedent for it you know these preterm infants have been given probiotics in the past yeah um and Actually, a lot of them do look quite promising. Yeah. But, you know, they can reduce the neck by 50%. I think we can reduce it by a lot more nice. with, by, with a more intelligently designed yeah. product. Well, in episode one, we had uh, Dr. Richard Hansen, who's a pediatric, uh, well, he's a pediatrician. Yeah. And I think has an interest in neonatology. So, like, basically babies that have just been yeah. born. Yeah. And what he said, I recall, was that actually probiotics were really good for neck. Yeah. But still, for some reason, yeah. it wasn't being used in widely. No, not at all. In neonatal units around the country, which is just it seems a bit weird. Maybe if it was a drug and they wrote a script yes, for a drug, perhaps. people would be providing it more. Because I think there's always a bit of resistance from the medical profession. Also, there's a lot of snake oil. Oh yeah, completely. Completely agree. i I'm not gonna say who it is, but I've been going back and maybe you've seen it on LinkedIn. I've been going back and forth with this one probiotic company, just being like can you stop, you're saying your product is backed by 300 or whatever it is studies. Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> what you're doing is taking one of the strains that's in your mm. probiotic mixture and doing a PubMed search and then deciding that as a result of everything that's been published by other people. Yeah, yeah. Not in the context of your consortia. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? That's so frustrating. So, yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean... That makes it difficult. We go into boots, we buy probiotics so we're holding the barrett and we culture them in the lab just because it's just really interesting yeah. for us. And we've often get bacteria which actually, they're not even listed on the packet. Really? Uh, you know, it's, it's like, oh, that's weird. We thought it's not that one. Let's, wow. let's double check the packet and it's, it's different. Generally speaking, I, my view or what I heard was that the bigger companies actually, if you buy one of them and it says it's got E. coli nissel or something like that in it. It's probably got E. coli nissel in it because they're, they're big and they've got the quality control mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, there's still a big hesitancy, I think, within yeah. the medical community for probiotics. Yeah, absolutely. And that's because, as you say, originally it was, oh, this is really easy to culture and it's stable. So this is a great candidate. Whereas what you're talking about is the future. And that is let's rationally you know intelligently design a mixture of bugs which have been designed intelligently based on their phenotype and what they're going to be doing within the recipient essentially yeah. within the microbiome so it sounds like what you're doing is you're trying to understand as best as possible what the healthy microbiome in breast milk looks like yes 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 yeah? yes, yes so it sampling a lot of different women and i have to say it is variable um which is a shame some women 
we call them our super donors, have very rich breast milk with, wow. uh, probably similar to you. I it mean, is, yeah. You know, yes. they've got very rich breast milk with lots of different of these bacteria, which already in literature have been shown to be doing quite a lot of different things. Um, you know, boosting the first immune system, for example, is a really important role of these first microbes that you get exposed to. And then some women, it's basically a desert. There's hardly anything. Really? There's hardly anything. Have you correlated that to anything? Like, have you got any yeah, well, suspicions? Still, yes. I th- we're, we're still piecing things together. So all our donors give them quite a long questionnaire, which we keep on adding to and being like, oh, no. Yeah. But it's hard. We want to ask them the world. So what, what you're we doing. want to spend them an, an hour doing it, but we Babies are, you know, mothers have just had a baby. Yeah. So it's quite hard to try and get the most efficient questions out of them. But uh, but what you're doing is really important. That that characterization you're doing on both the the donated um, milk, but also mm-hmm. of the profile of the person donating is actually really valuable. It sounds like no one's actually done that before. Oh well, that's 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 kind of used to say. It's yeah. Really I mean, important. We've we've struggled to try and make all these different links. I mean, there's often a paper that's out that says, oh, if they were given antibiotics in this particular time period, then that means that their milk is less good. But then it's, it's well, less good. That's, you know, less diverse with, with microbes. But, but for all these different other factors, what was that occupation? You know, so actually one of our super donors was a primary school teacher, which I think <laughs> is really telling. That's probably really probably she's been exposed to so many, you know, so many of these little, little cute children and they're all germy and yep. seizing. Germ factories. Yeah. The stool or gut microbiome mm. in the super donor, have you got any idea if that correlates? Like, is, is there a correlation between gut microbiome diversity and breast milk microbiome diversity? Do you know what? Just because of a purely, sadly, we haven't been able to, we haven't been able to take their stools. Very sadly. Yeah. Maybe we should couple up and uh, yeah. <laughs> set, set, set up a yeah. project on your FNCs. Because yeah. Purely just because when we first started, we just didn't have enough cash. And there's so many questions. So we, we get the baby stool sample because that's very important to see that these bacteria that we isolate from breast milk are actually showing up in the baby's stool. But we and haven't been able is it? to. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but we also, but not, not all of them though. There's a lot, to be honest, this thing about microbiome as well, there's a lot of bugs that, that, that we culture and we're just like. What is that? That's not doing anything, is it, realistically? Yeah. That's just that's just on for a ride. It's passenger. It's going to die as soon as it goes into the in, gut. In terms of like scale, I mean, like in the gut, there are probably like 300. 400 500 different species oh yeah it's much less typically. in breast milk microbiome yeah, yeah it's like orders of magnitude less is it like you know well, actually, five uh, to ten about 200 species have been identified from breast milk microbiome but it does vary i mean we don't see in some in some of us we might just see five different species but then in others our super donors we tend to see a lot more we tend to see a, a, between sort of 20 and 50 it doesn't oh, really wow. go wow so the super donors that. are an order of magnitude higher in some yeah. cases that's amazing yeah sometimes there's got to be something there yeah and are the are the babies of the super donors more healthy so that's what we're we're, we're trying to track so that's why we, we track a few right. of them over time it's, it's going to be a long study yeah that's the yeah. thing yeah. um yeah. but yeah i mean all of the right now we are sampling mostly from full-term mothers yeah um in, instead of pre-time mothers but we how, do you, how do you find the the mothers? Like, I mean, that, that probably sounds like a ridiculous question. <laughs> There's mothers everywhere, but how, um, how do you, you identify? What? Mostly from word of mouth. Really? Yeah, and we use apps. Facebook's amazing. There's lots of breastfeeding support groups. And next door, we decided not to go down the hospital route purely because it's, well, first of all, you're getting them all from the same hospital, which sort of limits your sampling quite a lot. But then all, uh, but I, I, where you can get way more, but it also just the ethical consideration just takes a lot longer. There's a lot of bureaucracy over having to yep. get that all approved and through. So, and it's been very, it's been pretty easy for us actually getting donor, donors and donations. I think, you know, once you explain what we're doing, the research why it's important to mothers, they're, they're on board yeah. and they've got all their mates who've just given birth. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That they also want to donate. So for us, it's been, it's been fairly straightforward. How do you find your donors? Yeah, so uh, very interesting. I, there's, during the early days, mm. it was very like, I don't know if first generation advertising is like the right phraseology, but it was like newspapers, uh, email distribution lists, mm. posters, um and an element of word of mouth as the program grew um and we became better at like social media yeah it moved to a more digital form of advertising but we still found that the traditional forms of advertising were very high yield Mm. email being pretty pretty good particularly if you can get the right distribution list so like everyone who works within a building who are quite health conscious just as an example 
And then we built the number two brand mm. um, and the website. Yes. And we have vans now that drive around Aberdeen with number two mm. all over them. And there's just been this kind of, not exponential because that's the wrong word, but it, as the program has grown and our reach has improved, it's triggered a cascade of word of mouth and sharing yeah. and WhatsApp groups as well, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I went to the gym recently and started speaking to someone and I, I'm now top to bottom in Inside Matters clothing wherever I go or antibiotics clothing wherever I go. Yeah. So if it's hiking, I've got Arcteric stuff as well. just because like, I know if I speak to somebody, I'm, I can convert them to being a believer, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. so you will believe in the yeah. microbiome. Um, and uh, interestingly, I went to the gym and I was started chatting to someone and he was a nutritionist and a bodybuilder and um he started to say oh yeah 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 just off the bat one of my friends just started to donate for the stool collection program in Aberdeen I was like oh what's that called is it number two I was like number two I was like okay that's interesting so how's it going he was like yeah it's great I'm thinking about doing it myself eventually I said look it's actually I'm running that company but I was so excited That's to so hear, cool. so excited to hear yeah. that someone was excited about donating their stool to the number two program. That's almost, so, that's basically like that moment that um, people get when they finally launch a product and then they go into the shop yeah. and they pick up their project, <laughs> their, their product. You've yeah. had that now. Kind of, yeah. I was, sort of I was, the, yeah, I was really, I, I was really excited. I mean, this can go one of two ways. Yeah. Last weekend, and the person won't mind me saying this, I was in the Western Baths, which is where I go for the sauna and the plunge. Okay, lovely. And uh, I was speaking to this person beside me in the sauna. And um, said, uh, uh, just about to start his phase two clinical trial. And he said he was working as something. And he said, are you James McElroy? And I was like, and I was like oh God. <laughs> was like, <"Yeah>, yes. <laughs> he was like, oh yeah, I applied for a job uh, two weeks ago. No one got back to me. And I was just like, oh no. <laughs> I was like, I'm really sorry. I then ra I ran out very dramatically and got my phone and brought it back in to Sonny, which you're not supposed to do, and said, please add me on LinkedIn. I will, I'll make sure we reply to you. The thing is, for, for some jobs, we get hundreds of applicants. Mm. And we just, we, we don't have the resource because we're a small company to actually enable people to get good and proper feedback. Yeah. But it's, um, the whole number two thing was really empowering for me and I was really excited about it. I, I believe in the power of word of mouth still. We're not on TikTok. Oh, do you know Yet. what? We're starting to go on TikTok. Are you? Yeah. TikTok, breastfeeding TikTok is massive. And that's what we, we find out so many things though from our donors. It's like doing a massive sort of questionnaire. I mean, there's so many videos of mothers, yeah. for example, crying, so they've had to pour away all their milk because it's been left out too long and things like that. And you, you, learn, you learn a lot about, you know, what the different culture is. Of, I know gut health has gone like Yeah. Like oh yeah, it's huge. Like it's yeah. gone bananas yeah. on TikTok. Yeah. So I feel like I should be on there, but I'm also a little bit scared about I've never, I've never used it but i like everyone i mean i find linkedin addictive yeah 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 that's linkedin it's like a networking website never mind tiktok <laughs> which is like a, a, a design it's been designed seconds. to be addictive hasn't yeah it? yeah they've literally designed yeah. it to like, anyways sorry um so we going back to your donors we're word of mouth and mm. other things we just built um an app for donors to try and make the experience even oh, better that's cool that's yeah yeah I think, I don't know if we, I don't know if it'd be worth it for us just because we're, start, we're slowly, because we've got, right now a big collection mode, but then over time, of course, we, we get the same bacteria coming up again and we're almost, you know. So you think you're hitting a bit of a steady state now and you're seeing the same thing over and over? Yeah, potentially. Yeah, we're definitely, our massive discovery phase is sort of, we're mostly over that hump, but now it's, we still get new ones now and again. But I think, uh, yeah, for us, we've almost finished that sort of big collection push and a businessy type question then i i'm interested in why you decided you wanted to do it yourself rather than trying to find a, a group who maybe had existing or, or going to a bank for example oh that's a really good question um i suppose it, there was no decision not to do that mm -hmm. uh that that would have that probably would have been a sensible thing to do i think for, at, when we started it, it it was just let's just see we've got an idea let's learn some skills yeah. on the side and let this grow but then you know we we, we got the investment and then we you know we were like oh okay and then we just happened to know a lot of mothers have just about to give birth or had just given birth so we suddenly had actually quite a big pool already at our dis well not disposal yeah, <laughs> that sounds awful but you know ready re ready to use yeah um and then we just got really excited and we we so 
we're a team of three founders. So it's me, so I'm the microbiologist. Uh, but then I've got my co-founder, Seanad, um, who's, she's a chemist, but she did her background in cell biology and, um, sorry, her PhD in, yeah, cell biology in, uh, sorry, DNA origami, origami. And then my other co-founder is Tara and she's a neuroscientist, but loves bioinformatics. So we, we sort of had the skill set between the three of us, even though our PhDs went directly in the microbiome. Yep. We had a really, really great skill set for tackling the microbiome. Yep. And we knew exactly what experiments we wanted to do and, you know, how... And we had a bit of time to do them actually because during our PhDs we were allowed to take three months off to work full time. To do um, to, Yeah, to, to do that. That's what was in my head then mm. about not doing them side by side. But you still... Yeah, so I had three months off my PhD to work on that and then obviously PhD not four years long. long. Yeah, it's not <laughs> um, but we managed to sort of back back them up. So it was me and then Sean and then Tara. Yeah. And then, you know, we had enough data and then it was just... Funding. So you staggered the three months. Yes, yes, exactly. Proper co-founding yeah. teams. Yes. You so, took- oh, they're amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I couldn't have done it without them. So that's, again, balancing PhD with a company. I think um, we, I couldn't have done it without co-founders um, mm. at all. I don't know how you managed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't do a PhD. Uh, well, I think medicine yeah. degree, James, I, I but know. yeah. <laughs> a lot of people say, how. Uh, a lot of people with co-founders say, I don't know how you did it without a co-founder, mm. but um, it's one of these things where when you're in the thick of it, you're in the thick of it yeah and you just if you want something badly enough like if you've got that unstoppable burning mm. desire where you go to bed every night and as your head hits the pillow you're thinking about it and you wake up and the first thing you think about is how am i going to do this yeah you find a way yeah no you're that right. said burnout is a real thing yeah it is no, you're right well actually james interestingly you're going to love this okay i very nice to you now i went to a talk a talk that you gave at the bia Pulse program, which was in Francis Crick Institute years ago now. When was this? I think it was in 2019. Or no, yeah, 2019, March. I just turned 30 and I've started to lose my brain cells. I won't <laughs> actually remember doing But you that. gave, you gave, no, you gave a really good talk and you said, thing is, you have to give, you have to give yourself time because otherwise you're going to burn out. You have to go to, you have to let yourself go to the gym. And okay, you I'm to, still saying the and same you know thing what? now. It was great. No, but it was really empowering because you get so many stories of, you know, co-founders and people with my things about to fall off, yeah. um, you know, talking about how they get up at five in the morning and then they work, 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 and then <laughs> they, you know, head hits a pillow and then yeah. they sleep four hours and they do it again. And it's just so, I, I just- Not sustainable. It, and, no. and I, I don't believe people when they say they do that. So I'm really pleased that that had an impact. Yeah, it had a massive impact because I think, to be honest, we, well, I don't, we, there were points where we were doing that, but, 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 you know, I think- only not for very long. You got to keep it going. Yeah, you got to keep a routine of. You got to have that green juice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, apparently, gotta, I can't wait to have the green juice. You, you, to find you out. need to have some of that press press <laughs> green juice, uh, which is really good. But um, the uh, I that's really interesting because that was there four years ago, mm. and I haven't had a burnout in the last four years. I think I've been close to being at my limit. Um. And I, sometimes I think I've gone too far in the gym training direction, like <laughs> doing two or three Munros in a weekend and going oh straight back God. to training on a Monday okay. and then yeah. doing the sauna on Monday evening and then doing two gym sessions on the Tuesday, one with Andy Scott, the bodybuilder. And it's like, do I really need to do that? Mm-hmm. Probably not. Um, but it's true. You need to think about, so in some respects, startup is a sprint. I'm sure you've heard the, the phrase startups like, jumping off a cliff and figuring out how to build the plane and building the plane before you hit the ground and taking off in the plane before you yeah you yeah know, perish it's kind of like that right yeah. so it's a sprint in that regard you've yeah. also got competitors and now you've raised some money yeah and there's a burn yeah so you're burning yeah you're not burning the money but you're spending the money <laughs> you've got a big and, fireplace <laughs> and one day that money is going to run out and yeah. you need to have gone from a to b and maybe even to c before the money runs out so you can raise more money at higher valuation so in some reset respects it's a sprint but in other respects you're going to be doing it for a long time. Yeah. And you need to make sure you're putting the work in most days. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, it's never yeah. going to happen, right? Yeah. So it sounds like you guys have got that built into your... Yes. Your, well, yeah. I mean, we work really well together as a team, you know, and we know if someone looks at getting a bit burnt out, we're like, right. Holiday. <laughs> yeah. Yoga. Yeah, exactly. What um, are your burnout tips now that you're four yeah. years on from the BIA Pulse thing? Um, yeah, exercise. So I run. I like. I love running. Um, I quite like running actually without music. Interesting. Which I just. I don't know. It's more meditative. It allows you to decompress. Yeah, you just don't even think at all. It's just like white noise in your head. 
Um, nice. So I also love cold water swimming. I know that sounds really like. Oh, I love cold water. I say, oh, do you? Oh, uh, good. Okay. Two, two weeks ago, I was cracking the ice and locking. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I swim. <laughs> I, London's actually really good for cold water swimming. I heard. Yeah. Um, there's lots of yeah. different spots. Um, but yeah, I, I think like cold swimming is so, so fun. Cold. I don't really like swimming in the summer, actually. Yeah. I just find it, it's not, you, you don't get the thrill out of it. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit colder in Scotland. I'm not oh, no, lie, yeah, I'm too. sure it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're coming to this um, event, aren't you? In March. Are you not the uh, One Health thing we did, the conference? You know, oh, yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Well, I'll give you some well swim swimming spots if you want oh, when okay. you're in Scotland. That'd be There's lovely. many locks that are cold. Mm. <laughs> you're not you're wearing a wetsuit or not no no, yeah, no it's cheating that's, that's the, uh, <laughs> yeah it's, it's cheating but no, when you know it, what? i wear the gloves sometimes yeah the gloves and the, the i wear the gloves yes, and the boots as well yeah, yeah. yeah cool well i think cold water swimming is it's fantastic it's just such a yeah do you do the wim hof <laughs> no i no not no i just I do it do you yeah, yeah. breathe in <laughs> and out and you do that 30 times and then you hold your breath and then you hold your breath until you can't hold your breath anymore. Then you take what he calls a recovery breath in and then you squeeze the breath. And I've actually st slowed my heart rate and actually stopped my heart. That's so this. cool. I should, maybe I should do that. I'm try like, it. just sort of jump in and try not to scream. And then No, that's what you do. You don't, don't do Wim Hof when you're in the water. Right. You might pass. Oh, out. okay. Yeah, okay. You do it, you do it before medical. going in. Yeah, before you go in or just when you wake up in the morning. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it feels weird. Like but yeah, I know it sounds ridiculous. Why would you hyperventilate? <laughs> Why would you do that? But like, why do you do it? Why would you intend? Well, I'll. So that I'm not going to say I'm an expert in the science though, because I'm not at all. So, but I think it's something to do with alkanal alkalizing, right? Your blood, okay, and yes, that yeah. triggering cellular spring cleaning processes. Yeah, I'm trying to remember from Goop Lab when they sort yep. of discuss this, and also yeah. so the high CO2 when you're holding your breath acidifies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your blood, and that has some sort of benefit as well. Okay. I mean, Wim Hof is not some just some crazy guy i mean he he is he's mental he is absolutely mental yeah but he's also like a scientific yeah. physiological phenomenon yeah. i mean like they yeah. have done every possible experiment and he just he just defies what people think is possible yeah. every single time and that must be to do with him controlling his autonomic nervous system through his breathing and his cold water and everything like that so i'm a big fan in fact i'm probably going to do a wim hof thing with wim hof really that, yeah it was one of my 30th birthday things i was at this year i'm going to do one of wim hof's sort of uh two or three day courses where you like do his method for a day and then you go climb some mountain in shorts cool which actually sounds right up my street anyways so, so why i've waited so long but you turned 34 years ago i turned 30 last week oh what yes. i thought you said you turned, yes. turned 34 no, no. years I, i'm I, i'm 30 years old oh wow well, happy Jan birthday thank you Ch january 24th 1993 oh. yeah do I look, do I look, how can I look older than no, you don't, with all you the don't. stuff I, I do? You said you turned 34 years ago. All this ago, press sorry. use. And, so you were 26 like, oh, four years ago? Right. I was 26. And I heard you give your talk. Yeah, right. 26. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, I first started to get interested in antibiotics when I was like 24. Okay, cool. So started, you aged me, baby, by him. Yeah, started yeah, antibiotics at 24. Yeah, it's yeah. been that long now. Oh my cool. goodness. Yeah. yeah. I've got some gray hairs as well. But it's not <laughs> it's not it's not too bad. Yeah. I've seen people worse off at 30. Sorry, we're now talking about my hair. And that's that's <laughs> that's really off piece. We need to go back. Um we need to go back to Booby Biome and what's happening next. So you've got a good collection now? Yes, so we've got a big collection. We're testing all our different our different bacteria on um well, we've sort of simulated a gut in the lab and we're putting our bacteria on the gut. And How have we simulated a gut in the lab? What is that? Well, well, with, with this one, it's not very, there's more and more sort of, what was the word? Uh, there's better ways you can simulate guts that get more and more complicated. We're doing quite a simplistic one where we're just growing the cells of the guts that line your guts on in a Petri dish, essentially. Yep. And just keeping them alive. And But then, you know, even these cells of that line our gut, you know, they can release immune system factors they sure. can you know they can respond to inflammation you they can the barriers the, the, the tight barrier junctions can sort yep. of fall apart um so you know it, it seems it's very simplistic but it's sort of a very good very early model you can do to simulate the gas in a petri dish and we're doing a lots of different experiments on our strains seeing how they if they can reduce inflammation for example if they can make those gut barrier functions you know get a bit closer and improve those tight those tight junctions yeah um we're doing we're doing a lot, we've got matrix of different experiments we're doing and scoring our strains essentially. But we're also looking at competition assays. So for example, if you've got a nasty, because preterm gut, for example, has already often got these 
not great bacteria there present. Um, and so and we're why, seeing why is that? Why are the bad ones there? Yeah, I think especially with all my C-section, the first microbes that get exposed to it often are surgical instruments, a hospital environment, yeah. uh, which is just very unfortunate. But yeah, yeah preterm gut is full of quite unusual microbes. They're not they're not what you normally really see in full term. Um, but yeah, we're seeing if we can outcompete those. So if, if we put our bacteria onto our little simulated guts, can they, yep. you know, can any other ones not be there? So we're doing a whole, a huge number of different experiments. And then from that, we're sort of making a smaller and smaller list of actually what are the functionally relevant bacteria, which definitely are doing something, as well as can they survive into the gut? So formulation is a really important thing in microbiomes. So it's all very well. You can have your perfect mix of bacteria and hypothetically they should survive the gut because obviously we've seen them in breast milk and we've seen them in stool samples but bacteria in the body can behave very differently from you know bacteria that have grown up been freeze dried been mucked about and yep. kept so up you know got not great temperatures so can they survive that and also then you know colonize and, and, and live in the infant gut so a huge number of tests and then from that we're going to go you're doing all of this in-house we're doing most of it we're outsourcing a little bit um, we've done, we've outsourced most of our, so as well as sort of testing these strains, of course, with, when we get breast milk, we want to see exactly what's in that community. And we're looking at very high level of resolution, um, you know, what particular substrain is doing that particular thing in the breast milk microbiome. And we've outsourced that. There's, there's, microbiome actually is supported by some really great companies that can offer really good services, but it's really come along. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we use Cosmos ID who are great, um, but yeah, they can just really quickly least send them our DNA and they read it and they, they tell us what's in there and that's really really helpful and that makes us so much faster more agile otherwise we'd have to have a yeah, very expensive sequence machine too. in the house and a, uh but yeah so uh yeah so yeah we're testing all of our strains at the moment and we're kind of working out what would be optimal but as we're doing this there's more and more papers coming out all the time talking about c-section babies and formula for babies I mean there's one that supports your narrative yes that's what our narrative but, but yes. also make us think about other products that we could potentially develop um oh. outside of preterm infants so that is something we're also keeping an eye on um okay. I don't know if you've seen there was a paper that was released um in the end of last year where they found that c-section babies respond less well to vaccines than full-term babies so That's it's it. really your first microbes that are having wow. this really profound influence. So even so, at that very early yes. stage. So even though C-section babies, their microbiome can actually, so actually at first it's very different, but then it will converge and look very, very similar to a naturally delivered baby's yeah. um, microbiome, especially if they're breastfed. But the, even that, even over a similar, you know, age of one, that, that's that difference actually can already, wow. it's already happened. It's your first bugs, it's your wow. first so training of the immune system. So. That's this really microbiome immune system link is yeah. the real deal, yeah. isn't it? There's also with um, the research coming out for for babies, so it was a paper published in very in, yeah, in February now, in January, um, where they found that babies that were given antibiotics, if they were breastfed, they're three times less likely to develop asthma than if they were formulated. Three times? Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, there's, so we're keeping an eye on also what's going on you know, outside of preterm infants, but we're really at the moment sort of trying to focus because that's obviously very important to try and not be a complete jack of all trades. Um, I presume that it's not possible to take a breast milk sample and like expand it somehow, you know, in some master bank. Yeah, so that, that is an interesting idea. We have thought about that. Um, and it probably, it could be possible. I think the difficulty is because there is still quite a lot of variation between donors. We'd have to be, and you don't breastfeed for that long often. I mean, you're supposed, World Health Organization recommends that you breastfeed for a year and a half, which is ages. I mean, when when you when you first have a baby, and you know the first six months you're meant to be exclusively breastfeeding, and that's at least six times a day plus a night feed. Um, so you know it's really difficult. It can be really that's painful. It can be really painful for women as well. So actually, our breastfeeding rate, rates are quite low, but it's, it's quite rare for mothers. I think the UK is particularly difficult because there's not much support, unfortunately. Um, but after for two mothers. months. Yeah, not for, much support for mothers. Yeah, for mothers to continue breastfeeding. There's not there's not much. It's quite difficult for some, for some women to pick it up, for some mothers to pick it up and to continue. And it can be very painful. You can get infections. Yeah. Um, and I think actually in the UK, it's about 50% by two months of stopped breastfeeding. So trying to get reliable donors um, is just a, it's slightly more of a challenge. And then even if, even if you know, it's really the first three months of breast milk that we're interested in. So that window's even smaller. And then even from that... Um, it's yeah, it's just it's just you got to you have to screen it. I guess I know you guys do that for FM, FMT, but mm -hmm. it's a guess and it's babies, so we have to the screening process could be really careful oh, with what's in there. Yeah. So yeah, it's something we've considered, and maybe there'll be that might be a nice product 
down the line. Um, Because I'm just thinking, are there other benefits to the natural milk beyond oh of the course oh yeah oh Probably yeah yeah few. there's no we, but what you're saying though i guess is the, the positioning of the product is not it's not a replacement for no no no, no, it's no. It, yeah it's a supplement. adding it into the mix yeah yeah yeah, yeah. to give it the microbes that that makes a total sense yeah. and, and yeah. from a competition point of view like can you speak about other companies doing this or are you leading yeah so i mean it's, it's, it's difficult for, for us we don't really there are many infant probiotics out there, but we don't think of many of them as particular competitors often because they've not been clinically validated. They've not been particularly rationally designed. Yep. Um, and when we culture them in-house, we're getting different strains and what they say. So we're not at the moment really thinking of them as really organizers. And also right now we're also- Scary. Trying to, scary. Yeah, it's scary. That's yeah. scary. But we're also trying to target pre populations as well in hospitals. And so actually from that number, you you, you massively have a lot, a lot less people interested. Um, but the, the probiotics that are out there are normally one or two strains. Sometimes they're free bacteria strains, yep. which I just don't think is sufficient for covering all the different- babies and the different environments they're from and different right. ethnicities and geographies and you know i that i just don't think it it doesn't make sense to me that just one or two strains can have this amazing effect um so that's really where we what we, we're planning to differentiate because some people sit on the um i mean there's a spectrum of you know single strain all the way to what we're doing which is pooled microbiomes derived yeah. from people so it's like higher diversity than any yeah donor yes and some people say well we think the single strains are sufficient and yeah i i, I think that's a problem with a lot of these clinical trials already with preterm infants and neck is that they've they only seem to work if they're if these babies are lucky enough to be given breast milk if they're not um and, and so the breast milk we know already's got the microbiome in them ah so, you know right. a, a lot of the best ones of you know so i think that these bacteria are, you need to get the right environment as well you need, you need um to He's getting back, back, back. So you're in the consortia side. We are, yes. I mean, yeah, essentially. Rather than the single. Strain. It makes sense. I mean, it's not only just for health. We're trying to all our different bacteria will have different, slightly different functions, mm-hmm. but we do need a bit of redundancy. We think for these strains to take, um, because there is differences between infants. So you just need right. maybe this bacteria will work for one infant, right. it work for the other one. But if you've got a similar one, it might work for that one as well. Yep. Trying to be a bit more broad. So the redundancy piece is that they might not all be absolutely necessary. But it may be the case that some take up in some recipient microbiomes and don't get booted out by the immune system, whereas in others, it's a different picture. And if you have enough, you're likely to get an effect in every single patient. That's what we hope. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Are you able to talk about at this stage what the vision is for the business, like where you want to take it? And Yeah. um, Yeah. yeah, I mean, we we really just want to, I mean, there's, I think something that we find all the time when we talk to parents is that. But there's so much unknown about but people sort of know that oh c-section maybe i shouldn't have done it but oh, i couldn't help it and obviously i'd never say to someone don't get a c-section because sure. i think how many babies would have absolutely. just not survived if it wasn't a c-section yeah, so that's mental to just be like yeah. you know just discourage women from getting c-sections if they, if they need to 100 percent. um but you know 100%. they're very worried about oh but what's what's the case of the microbiome and um or same as uh antibiotics they feel like oh should i not should i have said no to the antibiotics no of, you should have course, said yeah it's yeah, like if yeah. they're clinically indicated then exactly, please do exactly that. and yeah. but, but so there's so much doubt and i think that's awareness of microbiome is rate is you know is, is is getting greater i think i think it's important um for people to have a place to go to to get useful information. So we really want to be positioned as a place where you can get clinically valid advice as well as products that can help um, yep. for all parents. Um, we, we we think that, you know, microbiome is so important to so many different diseases um, and, you know, long-term great health outcomes too. And it starts as soon as you're born. So for us, we just really want to just think, we, we think that, you know, if we can get all of these babies having the right microbiome immediately, that's going to have a huge impact on mortal health and really improve the quality of, you know, the next generation's health. And that's, that's where we want to be. We want to, that's our vision. And yeah, our mission is really just to, to support parents and, uh, and, and to achieve that. And you took on some funding last year, is that right? Yes. Or the year before last, last yes. year? Yes, yes, yes. How was that process? Uh, well, so half of our funding is from grants. So we've won some grants from Innovate UK and also from um, uh, IUK. And that was hard. It, got, it took a while learning how to write grants and um, getting enough data to persuade the reviewers as well yep. how to do it. We failed a lot <laughs> in winning grants. I don't know how, if you've tried the grant 
rant writing route. We have, I mean, we're doing less and less of it now because yeah. the amount of money we're spending per month yeah. is getting to the stage where it, it needs to be a mm. huge grant for it to move yeah. the needle. But the most recent one was the grant that Imperial College submitted with us as a co-applicant oh, yes. to the yes. Medical Research Council. Yes. yes, That was like a two million cool. pound plus um, uh, grant award. And um, it, well, yeah, we've been knocked back many times from grant applications for sure. Yeah. Um, even with what we thought were really strong proposals. Yeah. yeah. Not saying we wouldn't do another one. I think we, we probably will. And, and um, it just has to be sufficiently sized for it to move the needle for us. Because as you know, it's a massive time commitment to produce a good grant oh yeah oh yeah 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 and it's you, know? you put you put your all in it and you get really excited and we've had a lot of failure of grants but when you finally win one yeah that good. was a game changer because it meant that we could suddenly we could demonstrate this to investors you could go to investors and be like look we won a grant their due diligence is basically done um and right. you know because because it has because i mean your grant reviewers are experts from all walks of biotech and you know doctors and yeah so, I mean, it really has been done if, if, if you've successfully won one. Yep. And from that, we managed to get, yeah, some investment from a VC and also some angels, um, yep. angel investment, which is really great. And it's really, it, yeah, it's, it, they're, they're really helpful advisors that we've got. And we've managed to build a board now of, yes. of, di of different different people from- it's Very important. Yeah, making different different products. So, yeah, it's been really exciting. Um, good. And yeah, we've got enough runway for a couple of years. About, oh, good. But, uh, Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> not yes. not many companies can say that at the moment well as long as we keep fairly small it's, <laughs> yeah 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 we, we actually raised at the perfect time we we're really really lucky good because we closed it in april very good and uh how many employees are there yes oh we're pretty small and um, we're, we're still trying to outsource a lot to be honest we're we're, we're six at the moment we sort of wax and wane a bit mm -hmm. but yeah we're six at the moment that's good and that explains yeah. why the costs are not like well, we're also really lucky because we're not. yeah we're we're collaborating with an academic at the Institute of Child Health, which is the research arm of Great Ormond Street Hospital. Oh, perfect. So what, we, we've got a collaboration name. with her and she's really great. She's giving us her lab space at a fairly reduced price. Fantastic. Because um, they're really supportive. UCL's a great university. It's where I, well, that's where I did my PhD. And so very supportive of our that's venture. Good. And yep. we've got all these visits in our hands. Yeah, exactly. Illumini smashing it. So that's been very helpful for us. Yeah. Good. Very good. Well, um, I think we've gone over an hour now oh. and yeah, <laughs> I don't know how long we've actually been going on for, but uh, we did say we would try and keep quite tight for time and I was given strict instructions by you not to talk. No, no. <laughs> I'm Jay, only joking. I'm just mad. Jay, you I'm need to go to your child <laughs> training. <laughs> I know it was the gender. <laughs> I'm just winding you up. I'm, I'm totally I'm very wound up now. No, uh, <laughs> you've been a great guest um, and there's lots more things to talk about. So maybe we can uh, go on again. And you can interview me if you want and ask me lots of I'd hard questions. <laughs> Real you. But this yeah. is great. I wish you all the best with uh, Booby Biome. If people want to follow your company's progress, where do they go? Oh, um, yes, we're on Instagram uh, at Booby Biome, as well as, of course, LinkedIn. Uh, with, we're not sure about Twitter, but we're, we, might, we might. We do have a Twitter account. We don't use it much. TikTok? No. TikTok is where, yes, we're going to be big on TikTok. <laughs> We've got great big ambitions, but we're still early on TikTok. So most of the content is really our Instagram, Good. Instagram page. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. great. Thank you. Good, good.